Oh, I can. Oh, I think I can. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to students whom I don't have to grade. So for me, it's pure fun. <laughs> and uh, because I don't have to grade, uh, I can also be, you know, more relaxed, I think. Uh, you read some serious stuff. I'm not going to be very serious today. I don't think that I'm generally very serious. And especially now, I don't have any seriousness left. So I'm going to talk about uh, things that you can relate to serious stuff, uh, but also to show you how, how it functions for me. I'm a, I have a PhD in humanities. I've been teaching for a while, but I'm also a photographer and I'm very concentrated on the visual uh, aspect of what I'm teaching more and more. And this is why I'm going to start uh, with an image. And you went to Renaissance and you've talked about uh, Renaissance painting, I guess, right? And the meanings of Renaissance uh, symbolism. I'm going to show you a painting which I really, really like. And I hope that you can tell me what you see, okay? I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully what is on my screen is the proper stuff because one never knows. Uh, here we go. Okay. Looks good. Okay, so I'm going to make it a full screen. So this is Paolo Cello, 1470s painting. And I'm, I'm letting you enjoying this for a moment. And can you tell me, what do you see? Knight killing the dragon. It's not a knight, it's um what's his saint? Oh anyway, he is slow uh Saint George. That's Saint isn't... George, yes. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. Saint George slaying a dragon, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? What's the last time you saw a dragon, let's say? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> how do we know it's a dragon? Like how you know, because obviously when you look at this beast, it's like, oh, it's a dragon. But on the other hand, we hopefully never seen a dragon, right? So how do you know it's a Harry dragon? Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, right? Uh -huh. And generally a uh, representation. And the same with the knight, right? Because you can say it's a, it's a knight. Uh, you can say it's St. George, but you know, like also the knight in the shining armor idea. And I think that not many of us seen a knight in a shining armor in this kind of situation ever in our lives, right? But everything here on this image tells you it's a knight in a shining armor on a huge, very well-fed white horse attacking this beast. So St. George killing a dragon. Do you see anything else here? I'm just about to say it's Satan holding the leash, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh -huh. some, someone's holding a leash. The dragon is on the leash. Yes, we have a link between the lady here but and the, the dragon. So the dragon can be on the leash. Maybe she's embodiment of evil. What else could it be? What do you think? Like, really, like, why guesses? There's absolutely no right, you know, understanding of the 15th this is century. What, what century yes. was it? 15th. 15th. Mm, I wonder whether it's evil woman association between evil and femininity. Uh huh. Okay. Evil woman. Maybe an that? evil woman. Look at her. She doesn't look very nice. <laughs> no. What else? What's the, what's the, what country are we in, Joanna? Italy. In, in Italy. And so the- it's Florence, actually. Oh, who did, who's, who's painting is this? Paolo Cello. Paolo Cello. 
Sorry, you said that. Thank you. No problem. She may be trying to like tame, tame it. Yes, because yes, because this thing, this link here, it could be that the dragon is chained to her, but maybe it's a leash, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a leash, but like really, like without trying very hard to think what the 15th century painter is trying to tell us, I hate this expression, what a modern viewer is seeing, don't be afraid to say it, if you see it, because I know that you probably do. What a modern viewer is seeing. I mean, she's a, she's a regular woman, it looks like, you know? I mean, she doesn't look particularly evil or frowning or anything. I mean, she looks like regular mm -hmm. and she's wearing robes that, you know, you could wear as a, as a Florentine noble or, or, or a regular person in, in Florence, maybe a trader family like the Medici or something like that. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she doesn't look weird. I mean, the, the dragon is certainly <laughs> eye-catching, but... <laughs> 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 she almost looks like she's yeah like calm like it's like a normal thing for her a little bit like kind of in that sense like she's just very calm she's not screaming or running away so maybe this was like <laughs> hit and then he came thinking that um she was in danger or something and killed and killed the dragon okay so like the fairy tale right story so we have a damsel in distress the dragon was like kidnapped her and kept her in his cave. And here the knight comes killing a dragon, liberating a princess, getting a princess as a bride and half of the kingdom as, you know, an extra credit here, <laughs> right? Uh, this is possible, but it's don't just have to also that, that like it, it's, she doesn't really look like she's in much distress. Was that um, yes. am I um who I'm I'm not seeing who's talking, but um but that it's it's a you know like she doesn't really look very distressed for some yes be, because this would be the classical tale, right? The lady in distress, a knight in a shining armor, and the ugly beast, and the moment of liberation, he's coming from light, from above, from the sky, he's obviously associated with the sky and she and the beast are coming from the cave that are associated with darkness. But there is something in this painting, this is why I like it so much because it could be read in so many ways, including very weird ways, because she makes this gesture with her hands. Can you see this gesture? There's like dismay here, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, like this reading of this painting is like, dude, I'm walking my dragon here. <laughs> what are you doing? It's like, I'm walking my pet dragon. We are not bothering anybody. And here you come with your horse, with your lance, with your power, and you're attacking my pet. Why? Can we read it like that? Or mm -hmm. am I completely crazy? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it definitely makes sense. <laughs> Yes, okay, if it makes any sense. Uh, I don't think that this is intended. This is the 21st century reading. This is, we've watched enough, we read enough of weird stuff to read art in different ways, right? And who is going to tell you that your reading is worse or not correct? In a situation like this, I can really argue my point here <laughs> that she is the one who is walking the dragon. Anyway, well, especially we main... <laughs> have a whole like thing around this now with you know like uh, you know having pet dragons and and uh, or or like growing dragons from little baby dragons and and um, you know like everybody's a everybody's a um, Game of Thrones fan, so. <laughs> Yes, because you know, like where my reading is coming from is definitely all these texts, right? That's how this 
this is completely flipped. This is not the traditional tale any longer. This is the modern tale for me. However, this modern tale is sitting very deeply in its traditional ground. As I said, the night is coming from the sky. He embodies the light. She's coming from darkness. She embodies the darkness, earth, femininity, the cave, and whatever unknown sits in this cave. And my point here is that people would read this painting differently depending on where they are from, what's the level of education, what did they read, what did they watched, and also where in the world they are. Because let's say uh, dragons are understood very differently. I'm not going there because this is a lot, but dragons are understood very diff differently in the West, but let, let's say in the East, right? When they actually represent good luck, happiness, positive things. We in the West don't like dragons because of this association with the beast. So when St. George is killing a dragon, he's not just killing an ugly beast, he's killing devil. And this is possible association with her as something evil too, right? Because femininity doesn't get good reputation in a traditional narration. And this is mostly what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, witches, partially. Uh, and I have a good reason for that, because if you look at the date, what is the date today? 27th of April. 27th. Yes, and in four days, there is a big celebration that you can celebrate if you want. <laughs> because my <laughs> poor business are you aware of this? Are you? What? I'm sorry, you, you're breaking up. What was that? It's Valpurgis Night. Mm. Are you familiar with Valpurgis Night? So I started with the Italian painting. Now I'm going to show you a music video and you can dance to it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a second. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. I, I'm not going to share screen any longer, right? Right. You, okay, you so can. I, I'm sharing again.
that was weird. It is, right? <laughs> so what is a August action? What are they doing? Tell us. It's a real holiday. If you go at this time of the year anywhere into Northern Europe, uh, Valpurgis night, actually, for example, in Sweden, this is a national holiday. Uh, in the similar way as there is Halloween in the United States, uh, Valpurgis night is this holiday in the Germanic wor world where the gates open. You know about it, right? There are certain days during the year when worlds connect. So Valpurgis night is this day in Germanic world. And these days are always situated on in between, like Halloween is the end of fall and the beginning of winter. Valpurgis night is actually the end of winter and the beginning of spring. So what it is, this is a holiday of life. Right, and it's celebrated mostly, uh, it, it's connected mostly to the rebirth and the new beginnings. But as many other uh, folk rituals, it has its very practical element because the main aspect of the celebration of the Valpurgis night is uh, are huge bonfires. And bonfires is always fun, right? Uh, if you ever attended one, uh, but also if you think about it, you are somewhere in Scandinavia, the winter was long. You spent in the traditional agricultural society six months with your livestock in the same house. Believe me, you have a lot of things to clean. And not only you have a lot of things to clean, but you have a lot of things that you don't want to keep any longer, which makes a perfect material for bonfire, right? And you already have a huge fire, so you can have a celebration and dance and sing. And also, if you ever went to Germanic world at this time of the year, you probably saw the maples, people climbing them for prizes. So it's about food, it's about dancing, it's about the drinking, and it's also about sex because this is a fertility holiday. And when you are going to read Faust and if uh, you are going to go farther in your own studies to other Faust stories, uh, weird things happen on Valpurgis night because when the gates open, the witches uh, gather and actually on Valpurgis night, there was the biggest witches uh, gathering on Brocken in Hearts Mountains in Germany. And they gather to dance, drink, have fun, and celebrate life all together. And now think about them. When you think about the witches, when you think a witch, I told you I'm obsessed with images. So when you imagine a witch, what do you see? Seductress. Seductress. So yes. actually an attractive person. Yes. An attractive person. Interesting. I feel like huh? I feel like witches are attractive, I think. I don't think they're like the stereotypical, like the mole on the nose and like what you see in Hocus Pocus. I think it's more so um, if they're inviting, there's I don't think they're really bad necessarily. I feel like they're spiritual, you know, so maybe uh -huh. they differently than other people do or you know, but I feel like look-wise, I think that they look similar to everyone, you know. Okay, so stereotypical, but there is a stereotypical image, right? What is the stereotypical image? Well, the, the stereotypical image is is uh, Eastern European, I guess. And it's, it's this uh, very uh, mature person. <laughs> to put it in mind. Yes. <laughs> with uh, with uh, warts on her nose. Uh -huh. She has a very large nose. And uh, and uh, on occasion she uh, cooks little children for yeah. dinner. Yeah, right. And, and uh, flies around on occasion on, on her uh, on her uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh-huh. Who is a, a woman too, right? So I mean, it's this a woman. Is saying almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a woman by definition, right? It's a woman 
Yes. A woman, but not a woman at the same time, right? Because uh, is she young? No. No. No, she's not young. She's, uh, as you put it, uh, very kindly, very mature, but I would put it like this like, old hog, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is definition of it. So old, she can be attractive if she wants, but the, because she's a shapeshifter, right? And this being a shapeshifter gives you an idea this is all very unstable ground. You don't know where you're standing here. You cannot really understand it completely because you never know what you're seeing. So, but when you think about the standard, old, ugly, unkempt, right? Some other mention a word. Uh, how about clothing? Ragged, rags. Rags, colors, and the colors? Uh, gray usually, or or uh, or uh, camouflage, not camouflage, but black. I think gray, you... black, gray, dark, dark colors. Dark colors, purple. I feel like dark gray, black, brown. Like when you said camouflage, I really see this like indescriptable green kind of right. But and it looks like she just. And something purple, maybe. Mm -hmm. What is she? Okay, so rags. Um, does she have a hat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> pointy hat. Pointy hat. Okay, pointy hat. Let's keep it in mind. Where does she live? In the woods, usually, in like a shack, like cabin type. You know, I feel like the houses are always inviting, though. I feel like to invite like little kids in or people in or something like that. <laughs> okay, okay, let's let's not get to the house yet. Think about it. It's in the woods, right? Have you tried walking through the woods with the huge pointy hat? <laughs> <laughs> it's incre point. incredibly impractical. So you are mixing two orders here. The pointy head, which is the Western witch. And at the same time, you are taking this Eastern European witch and you are putting her into the woods, but you are giving her something like from, you know, wicked witch attire, the pointy head. Let's drop the head. She doesn't have any use for this head. How about her hair? Also very unkempt. Yeah. Unkempt, not that. Uh, can you see like maybe a bat is somewhere like nesting somewhere there, right? Maybe something else, you know, like you don't want to touch this. You found the house. How does the house look like? Ah, good question. It's, uh, it's got, it's got, let me see what my grandma told me. Uh, it has, it stands on chicken legs. Oh, yes. The That's chicken nice. leg house. In Eastern Europe, it stands on chicken legs and it turns around and it actually can walk. It's not a it can thing. walk away. It can walk away. It can uh, move, right? So it's like a trailer in a way, right? She lives in a movable house. So this she isn't Hansel and Gretel. This is different from the, 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 the candy house that... that... Mm. That uh, that Amai was was talking about. So so, um, so there's like an Eastern and a Western version of these witches, right? So that's that's the point here, really. Like depending, you know, we all tell the same stories. They're the same stories everywhere in the world. When you analyze folklore, we all tell tell the same story, and then there are details, which are going to disclose to you what is the specific source of the story let's and i'm going to illustrate you with my uh, my personal experience uh, let's leave the witch behind for a second think about this red riding hood do you remember this girl she's going through the woods again to her grandmother's house right and she has a basket 
what does she have in the basket? Is it, I feel like it's like assortment of foods, but I thought, I don't know why I thought it was like sweets and then like bread or something, something like that. Cookies, uh, right? No. Cookies, American version. American version mm -hmm. cookies, but uh, in Eastern Europe, it's, it's uh, baked, little, little baked uh, things like piroshki. Like things. Yes, because this is the food that the person would bring to the grandmother, right? If you mm -hmm. read Brothers Grimm, it would be some hearty soup, right? There's going to be something like substantial. I remember my huge surprise when my French grandmother told me this story and the girl was walking through the woods with a bottle of wine. <laughs> and it was not in America. <laughs> it was not in the United oh, States. Oh, oh, fact, when I <laughs> going to her grandmother's house with wine and bread. I've seen pictures like that. I maybe, yes. maybe even in children's books. I mean, I didn't think twice about it because I just thought it was like, you know, this world no, in the children's books. No, no, she has like in my children in my book, she had a huge baguette and a bottle of red wine. And it was so natural for me. Because, like, come on, what's the grandmother going to do? How is she going to eat her bread without wine? It's obvious, right? Awesome. <laughs> and when I I'm telling this to my students in America, they're like, oh, you know, like not only the girl is sent to the woods by herself, but they gave her wine. <laughs> So like all the wolf situation is like secondary to all the scandal of little girl with the bottle of wine, right? So look at this, really like you look at the menu, you look at the clothing, you look at the details and you know who tells the story. Going back to the witch, we are mixing these two orders all the time because really the Eastern European witch is going to be slightly different than your Western European witch. And she is going to be completely different than, let's say, a uh, South uh, African or West African witch or the images of witches in American folklore and pop culture, which is sometimes criminal. Uh, so let's go to our average witch. The house, let's say it didn't run away from you. It's there, you see it. For some silly reasons, you decide to enter. You open the door. <laughs> what do you see? Can you see? You see a cauldron, like a really big cauldron with things like bubbling up. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes, okay, so you trip over the cauldron because you enter the house and it's completely dark inside. Uh, because it's dark, right? Does it have big windows? But there is the fire under the cauldron, so. Like there is no fire, uh, there is no big windows, but there are maybe like tiny windows, maybe but no glass, maybe a bladder of an animal. A uh, couple of spiders, can you see them? <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> Don't touch anything, it's going to be slimy and ugly. There's a cauldron, right? You already trip over it. You are hungry. You look inside. There is something. Are you going to are you going to eat it? No. <laughs> okay, let's say there is a spoon. You kind of hesitantly dig inside. What can you see? I have Newt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What 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 else did you get? Definitely some type of body part of some kind. Body part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you see in like an eyeball, maybe mm -hmm. some sort of a tail, right? Maybe parts of like of, of some toad. Actually, you gave up on eating, you look around. And you see all these ingredients somewhere there, right? There are ingredients because a witch does magic. How does she do her magic? Herbs. Tons of different herbs in jars. Herbs, herbs in jars. Something is like hanging from the ceiling, right? Drying. Yep. Mm -hmm. You cannot identify it, forget it. You slept through biology class. You don't touch anything, right? Uh, 
but all her magic comes from nature. Would you agree? Yes. Does she have books? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Do you see like a library? No, I don't think it's like a library. It's like you open one yeah. big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, maybe next to the skull drum, there is a big bo book, right? But there is. Uh, are there animals Potions. in this house? Potions. Are they, are they animals in this house? Yes, a black cat. <laughs> yes, there could be a cat because, you know, like when I look at this imaginary book, there is a cat and a toad, right? So I kind of push them aside. The book is ugly. This is like very, like lots of, like it's greasy, right? It's unkempt also. There are some notes on the margins. You see it's been used. This looks like a cookbook, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It looks like a cookbook, right? Uh, so she maybe has some recipes there, but we don't know if this is for breakfast or this is for magic. Uh, imagine her doing her magic. Does she have a wand, a magic wand? Hmm, a wand. Does she need it? So how does she do it? She stirs it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stirs it, it the and then says yeah, something yeah. with her hands like that, right? That's some weird so, uh -huh. so all she does is associated with nature, comes from nature, and she's really a part of nature, right? Because her house is not only in the woods, her house is far away from everybody. Why is she far away from everybody? It's very hard to find, right? You cannot go on the beaten path to find the witch's house. She's not going to be there, you know, like there is no signs this way to witch's house, right? Not many people go there. Uh, what, let's imagine that we are in some sort of timeless imaginary kingdom. Is the king going to visit? Is the king going to what? I'm sorry. Is the king going to visit this place? Are officials going to visit? No, you stumble into this place. When you, you, when you get lost in the woods, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. It kind of appears, right? It invites you in. Mm -hmm. And if there is an official in the story, they would go to the witch only under one condition or if they want either to kill somebody or if they want somebody to fall in love with them right but they are not going to ride with all these other knights and they are not going to make it official trip he's going to put the hood on and sneak through the woods so nobody saw them right so why is she so remote why is she removed Any guesses? I mean, I feel like you're headed toward an explanation of her being sort of socially isolated in some way, that, that there may be laws against what she's doing, that she's suspected of doing bad things all the time. And so she needs to kind of escape the law and she's outside the law. Yeah, she's illegal, right? What makes her illegal? She's not, oh, sorry. Black magic. Yes, because we assume she's doing black magic, whatever it means, right? Uh, we assume that she is evil. We assume she's eating children. Do we have any proofs? I haven't heard about any. Uh, but the general image is <laughs> very bad right but no, again she's not like she's not doing things um she's like outside the church it's like she's got this pagan past it, you know there that, is definitely uh, something pagan about it right uh when you think about if you have any background in mythologies uh classical mythology right when you think about all the 
big, like think about Greek mythology, something that most of you are to some degree familiar with, right? If you think about the male gods, they're mostly associated with the sky and with the powers of the sky. Think of, about somebody like Zeus or somebody like Apollo, right? The, 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 the gods of, the, of light. They're mm -hmm. in a way like this knight in a shining armor. And then think about goddesses associated with nature, with birth, with harvest, with animals, how they kind of connect to this, uh, to this witch idea. And also when you watch this video, the Valpurgis night, there is so much about the nature there because what Valpurgis night is, is this union between the sky and earth and the beginning of spring, right? And whatever is feminine in this story, comes from the earth. So this darkness here is feminine. The witch is assumed to be a negative power and therefore she's removed from society. She's put to the woods and she's uh, an outsider who is uh, rejected from society but she also rejects society eventually because there is so much harm against her in society. Uh, so let's flip this coin now. We have a witch, a female character working in magic. How about a wizard? wizard. Give me an idea of a wizard. We just said like how a witch looks like, right? So how, how does a wizard look like? Positive. Your friend, the grandpa. A grandpa, right? A grandpa. Yeah, then, when, yeah. you, when you see a wizard, you see Gandalf the, the white, right? So tall. Okay, he's old too, right? But mm -hmm. she's old and bent to the ground. He's tall. She is represented by dark colors. He's white or silver. Oh, his hair, long hair, uh, well kept, right? He's really, really taking care of himself. His clothing, how about his clothing? What color is his clothing? Colorful, bright with uh, shiny little stars, you know, Zeus on, on vacation. Zeus on vacation, right? Uh, in his robes with stars and colors. Uh -huh. How about a hat this time? Ah, still pointy. Pointy hat. Uh -huh. Where does he live? He advises the king sometimes. He advises the king. He <laughs> could be actually on the king's payroll. He lives in a castle. Can you see a castle and the highest tower in a castle and the highest tower, the highest apartment, like the, the, the penthouse of the castle? You can <laughs> go on this, you know, spiral staircase to the highest room in the highest tower. Can you see the light in the room? Mm -hmm. There is light in the room. You enter. Are you terrified? Just a bit, maybe, but not to the point you were in the woods, right? You enter the room. Is there a lot of light there? The windows, right? There is light. Yeah. Uh, but... I mean, if you're in Dungeons and Dragons, you assume that he's chaotic good. <laughs> but still good, right? Mm -hmm. Books, yes or no? Yes. Books, yes. right? Uh, library. Well organized. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Disney is Fantasia. Very. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very oh, pleasant yes. place to be. In. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pleasant place, right? There is a sofa. You are invited to stay, right? Maybe you can browse the books. Crystal ball something else with light, right? A wound, a, a, a wand, he's doing his magic with. And you, like, can you see like where these powers, the two different powers, where do they come from? 
Like, how did she learn to do what she does? And what, how did he learn what he did, does? Well, both come from nature. And, uh, and uh, in a way, uh, it's just exact opposite of what she does. So, so uh, she just happened to be not man. <laughs> yes, made... because we, we have two professionals working in the completely same business, mm -hmm. but we get completely different ideas about them. One of them is going to be forever associated with danger and negativity, and the other one is going to morph uh, as you approach me, Faust, uh, towards the idea of somebody not only friendly, but beneficial. Somebody who is going, whose powers come from studying, from rigor, and gets associated with science, right? Because if you, any of you study chemistry, you know where chemistry came from, right? It's pure magic, <laughs> right? It came from magic. It came from al alchemy. It's the same discipline, just with different rigors. So somehow, especially in the Western uh, culture, the idea of wizard morphed into the idea of scientists. Why the witch remains forever excluded? Uh, and not only this, she's going to be associated with dangers of nature. Uh, it's funny, I mean, I don't know whether you wanna go here, but it seems like also the, you know, we're, we've been reading Galileo, right? And so, and thinking about what he did in the world and, and what some of these uh, scientists and philosophers did. And it's almost like they, um, they, they do live in this world that's very religious, but they're kind of um, grappling with it with reason and rationality and trying to, um, you know, Galileo was very sneaky about it sometimes, but he was trying to sort of put, you know, put forward these scientific reasons in the face of some of the church teachings and trying to sort of send people in the rational direction. But then um, the women at the time were often cloistered. I mean, even Galileo's daughter was a, a nun. So it's almost like the, the, you know, like the witch is like the, a perverse version of a nun. Yes, but also this is a form of domestication, right? If you take this wild woman and you put her into nunnery, she gets under control. And especially she gets under control of the church. Because, the, yeah. because the, the role of the nuns in the church is subversive, right? They never get this kind of power as male figures within church do, right? So this is the way of controlling. Because this narration is really about controlling the female powers. And this is even more funny when you go between languages. Because uh, I have worked in translation for some time and translators get in, into big problems between translating uh, abstract ideas, which in different languages can be male or female. I'm going to show you a painting, another painting. Oops, what am I doing? This is the painting. I'm, I'm trying to put a few notes in the chat for people if you want to look things up afterwards or if you want to just kind of like uh, see more. But I'm not catching everything. But Can you see my painting? Like, it's not my painting. This is a painting that <laughs> I'm going to talk about. You didn't paint this? Excuse me? You didn't paint this? No, no, no. That's beyond the abilities. <laughs> What do you see? An old man by the window, looking out the window, and uh, it's spring. This woman is bringing spring, and uh -huh. uh, she's a hold. She's holding that. Is that a cis? Like a thing that you reap with? Maybe it's death. 
It is death. He's like dead in the window, it looks like. Oh, yes, okay. because look at this. He's either dead or dying. Yeah. He's on the verge of dying, right? So this is the moment when Grim Ripper comes to the old man. Some and look at the Grim Ripper. Wow. <laughs> because because death hmm. in Polish, which is my first language, is a woman. Hmm. It's she. Okay. What do you do with this? Look at this. Uh this is this was such a discovery for me, the idea of Grim Ripper in English, like a skeleton with the with the sit. With the sight. For me, yes, for me it's that. And you know, it's like in this painting is particularly beautiful because uh, can you see a dog? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually yeah. dreaming about teaching a course about the dogs in painting. I have enough material for this because we get so much from the way the dogs behave in painting. Like, can you see this dog here? This dog is terrified, right? So the dog knows something here. The dog can see what's coming. Dogs, it seems like animals always know first. Mm -hmm. And you know, like this idea of good death, because, you know, come on, she's not a bad looking death, right? Uh, she's an attractive death. Kind of sexy, so yeah. the, yes, a very sexy in the red dress, uh, no less. So and this kind is of nude, nude, you know, like nudish. <laughs> yes, but you know, like nudish, but not uh, bones with rocking flesh, right? Which is a common image in the Western imagery from Renaissance, right? Uh, the skeletons. This is a very friendly in a way, right? Given what his life is already. So this idea of death, as a part of nature, which has being somehow associated with death, but also this, there is such ambiguity here, uh, which I think is missing very often in Western narration about femininity and the meanings. There is such ambiguity here because she's death, but she's good death in a way. But also this fact that witches death and we have the another step to chaos that cannot be controlled, which is also associated with this concept of femininity. And what the wizard is always trying to control, because wizards, as the gods of the sky, they're always about order. Here we have this concept that this is not order. This is disorderly by nature. Like this woman from the cave with her dragon, right? The dragon also associated with femininity. If you, if you remember Greek mythology, this is the last weapon Gaia produces against Zeus, uh, a dragon. And when he kills the dragon, he becomes the king of the universe. And this is why all the Christian saints, like George, like Michael, killing a dragon are really killing the beast, no matter what it would be, right? And why Satan's imagined as a kind of dragon or serpent or? Yes, and the dragon and serpent. And then also in Christianity, you are getting this other twist of Virgin Mary stepping on a dragon or stepping on a snake and crushing its head, right? It's like femininity is kind of forgiven partially here. Yeah. How many of you watched this video about Baba Yaga? Did you watch it? Yes. And uh, it, uh -huh. the the twelve and a half, yeah, that one yes. I did watch. It's uh -huh. it has a, a lot of interesting messages. Uh -huh. there. At uh, at two minutes and eighteen seconds, there. Uh huh. It's showing. <laughs> um, it's implying basically uh -huh. invasion of Ukraine. Just, just, yes. Okay. If you, there, right there, right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can watch just, the fragment, okay? Yeah.
Aside from that, it's extremely humorous. It's very, there is so much satire there. It's just, you know, on the whole, like the the uh, the sanctions <laughs> comment that's that Satan makes. That's really oh, something. so you recognize it's a Satan? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> because not 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 even like the the. the Okay, because what happens, uh, for those of you who didn't watch it, there's going to be major spoiler. The idea is that the order is established in the universe, somehow like semi-Christian, but the story is told from the point of view of, um, of hell. And this hell is uh, under administration of a very inefficient, devils which are like folk devils and uh, they want to catch the witch and put her back into her cell because she ran away and she's like creating havoc she's disorganizing the world with the means a lot of cultural references which lots of them are slapping but you also have matrix there like obviously right and uh, other things but my point here is uh I, I, I always show this video to my students because they wonder what they see. Because I see different things, obviously, because this is my like cultural background. And always when you read something and we watch something, our readings are going to be different because we have different backgrounds. But still, because we have common education, we have a common language. And we can communicate at least we can kind of talk about this but however again these little differences are going to be details that really matter because as now we mentioned the, the invasion of uh, ukraine uh one of the explanations was that ukraine is not a real country there is no real culture there is no real like, cultural background and this is the cultural background. This is the real culture, the stories we tell. This is how, how we differ. And, and at the same time, we can communicate, right? Uh, so please do, do, do read, watch, and talk about these things. It's, it's, it's so well made. And, it uh, is. And there's the entire series. There is Faust, which I recommend you watch. And I've seen uh, uh, Professor Fogel put it there. Uh, but you shouldn't replace reading Faust with these videos because this is very, very <laughs> A little misleading. <laughs> a little misleading. There is also a video about a dragon uh, in this series. There is also a video about a basilisk. And they're also very deeply based in the like cultural codes, uh, Eastern European, but also general, because we all, we all, uh, we not only all benefit from the global ways of telling the stories and how we are the same when it comes to telling the stories, but we also all contribute to this. So, uh, Sometimes it's not easy to read.
So when you start reading Faust, uh, the witches are going to come back. The idea of uh, magic, witches, of the feminine, uh, its relationship to, to the idea of uh, rigorous science. Uh, and, and I wonder how, how many of you are familiar with the Faustian the Faustian deal. How a little. How little? <laughs> well, I, mean, I know the story. Uh huh. Yes. So you know that again, the story is being told and retold all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And there is definitely the old story. There is the canonical story coming from from renaissance and how it changes through from renaissance through romanticism which you are reading to modern times right but we are getting the story over and over and over again and uh it is a kind of it's like it's a story that sort of has to start around the renaissance time for the westerners at least because because it it it's like a challenge to the devil from someone who's human and feels like he can become a, a godlike in some way, like really, really become more than human, you know? And I don't think that people were really, I mean, there have to be exceptions, but it seems like, it seems like having the scientific revolution happening at this time and having uh, these new thoughts about religion, which is where I really think the change of the Renaissance comes because they're living inside a world that's very religious. It's very, uh, very organized by the church in a lot of ways, but then, but then that's being challenged on all these different fronts all the time. And then you get this kind of like widening of their perspective and they start to look at things out in the world and like Pico, Della Mirandola that we talked about briefly just kind of tried to systematize all the different uh, all the different religions like put them all into one system and try and figure out what the real truth is you know behind all of these and I think that's kind of a precondition to to someone thinking oh well maybe I can sort of like become godlike I can become a god and 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 challenge the ultimate evil you know by 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 tricking them with my with my knowledge and my you know I mean it's it seems like a very renaissance -y myth you know to, to start you know what I mean it is and uh for me uh the most interesting version is uh, how the Faustian deal can lead to becoming a witch. Because in the traditional Faustian story, you have a man. My favorite Faustian story is uh, Mikhail Bulgakov's Master and Margarita. I don't know if any of you know this novel. What happens when a woman makes a deal? Yes. She doesn't become a scientist. She becomes a witch. So he becomes like a so Faust, as a as a masculine guy, becomes uh, not so much a, a warlock as as like a or or I guess like a warlock, right? Somebody who can who can access the the natural knowledge. I'm just putting Master Margarita in there so people can see what that is um, that novel, but um, which is really famous, but it's. But like that story about Faust kind of deciding that he can make a deal with the devil and if he knows enough, he'll be able to just kind of win in the end, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because in, in, in my story, in my, in my talking about witches, I would like to stress that this is pre-Christian. This is pre-devil. 
that this association of witches with the devil is when Christianity takes control. Uh, this is much older and in a way uh, part of this is like how Christianity uh, kind of appropriated what, what was there, right? When you think about major Christian holidays, it's all appro uh, appropriated uh, pagan ritual uh, that could not be gotten rid of. And this is why it got appropriated, right? And uh, I mean, the same happens see, to witches. You can almost see it as, a, as like a continuation of some um, scientific studies because the, the whole thing, with herbal remedies and and knowing how uh, you know people nowadays like it's not unusual for people to say oh yes you know this herb can treat this condition or you know it, to look to herbal remedies for some things and but but it became uncommon because these women were ostracized as having done this kind of this kind of you know uh, science that wasn't classified as science. I mean, the yes. same way that Galileo was kind of kicked out for doing science that the church couldn't condone. Yeah. Yes, because yeah, I, you know, this is the, the sorry. The, the small example that I would like to add to this is May 1st is International Workers Day. So it looks like uh, socialists uh, also appropriated May 1st for their own uh, needs. Yes, because the holiday is like already there, right? And this is such a natural holy holiday because you think like what we celebrate, like when you look outside now, it's like it's calling for celebration, right? It's uh, also people didn't know uh, that, that, that winter was not real death. People didn't know about the cycle of life. They really thought that everything died and now it's reborn, right? That they didn't know. And you know, like when you think like what we know and how limited this knowledge is and how much of we are still guessing and how really similar we are to these Babylonians, right? Who are counting ants or something like this. Uh, we are not that far from them. Uh, and this is why uh, we invite different kind of different kind of explanations. When you think about the world now, if somebody had told you this, if somebody had told you this like three years ago, that you would spend like two years in isolation, that there's going to be COVID, and then there's going to be war in Europe, would you believe it? I would not believe it. I would never believe it. So I'm like really very much prepared to hear anything now, right? It's like I'm, I'm much more open to somebody telling me, you know, like in maybe in Kasai, the UFO just land that I would like, oh, okay. Maybe I will going to say, <laughs> say hello, right? The world, the world is extremely strange and it's telling us all the time that we really do not have any ideas. So this is why I think reading house is so much fun still. It's interesting that you mention uh, Egyptians and Babylonians, and I'm thinking of the uh, hieroglyphics and and uh, half man have birds and half man have lions. Yes, we I guess we didn't move that far. No, we didn't move that far. That's, that's the thing. And not only we didn't move that far, but you know, now the world is crazy. And I don't know how much of this, what I'm saying is applicable because uh, I, I, I'm talking about, you know, like my previous la life. So which is the Eastern Northern Europe. Uh, there was such, because of the European Union and the general unification, there was such a big turn towards the roots. This turn was almost, for me, similar to what happened in the 19th century, when people started to dig for original stories, for folk stories, when folk stories actually got uh, the status of high art, right? When you think about what Grimm Brothers did, or what Sir Charles Perrault did for French culture. And if you think about, you know, like, uh, Eastern European languages, how all this uh, 
major literatures were born. Oh, now you can observe my dog. Mm -hmm. uh, how they were born from folk stories, right? Like romanticism. Uh, Wagner. Yes, yeah, Wagner. Think about Wagner. Uh -huh. So this, in a way, it's it was very similar a uh, couple of years ago, at least. Uh, I was in Iceland and I got lost and I stumbled upon Odinic temple. And then I asked people like, are you like for real? And people were like, yes, you know, there's real, real reborn of pagan cults, of pagan cults, right? So of uh, Norse gods are really coming back. If you think like even of, of the productions of like Netflix productions, how many of them are about the local gods, about the local, um, beliefs. Uh, there's a fantastic uh, French show called uh, Zon Blanche. Uh, there is this, uh, I think, it's Norwegian series about uh, teenagers being gods. It's like yeah. it's all over. It's called it's all over. Excuse me. It's called Ragnarok. Yes, yes, it's called Ragnarok. You know, so th this is what I'm talking about. It's like really a huge renaissance to use the word uh for the local even when it comes to i don't know music right there are so many uh so many of the folk elements were incorporated like in rock into rock music uh that's I, I i remember you know like when i was a teenager nobody would be called dead in like in the folk costume now it became kind of fashionable. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's not me now. It's always like that. It's always like that. It's always my fun at the end. <laughs> So do you have any thoughts um, on, on the difference, like how the, how the traditions diverge in the, and, and why? Because of course, like we can see that in many places where women had a lower social status or they were, you know, considered dangerous and to be tamed in some way. I mean, that, that, that this seems, you know, like, the, it's it's understandable that that would be like some kind of a, a like become some kind of a complex and and people would would have witches as a, as opposed to wizards right like that 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 would diverge but in some places that doesn't happen I mean in some places there are other um, paradigms at work and I mean are there can you what do you what do you think of when you think of uh, uh, of the different places and how they developed that story? I, I think we are very deeply uh, still based on the stories, right? It's like when you think about the uh, societies like Scandinavian societies, so where, you know, like the position of women in these stories was always very high. Women were like, not only women, uh, but also in general people, the, the, the position of people like let's compare when you think about Greek mythology versus like Norse mythology. In Greek mythology, uh, obviously the goddesses, they're fancy, but there are not, the, the, the gods are superior, right? In Norse mythology, not only goddesses are kind of equal to gods, but also humans themselves are very high on this hierarchy, right? It's like in Greek mythology, Norse mythologies, uh, humans are puppets. In Norse mythology, humans are allies who are going to fight together with the gods against the forces of evil at the end, right? And they are picked for Valhalla, hand-picked for Valhalla by Valkyries oh, and Odin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, like the, the, this society is kind of evolved differently depending on what kind of stories we tell. Because even if we don't tell the same stories, the stories come back in disguise. The stories come back with names, the stories come back with, you know, like different versions of the old stories. Uh, by the way, by names, I have to tell you the anecdote, maybe we, we can finish with an anecdote. 
If you ever go to Poland, the northern peninsula of Poland, I don't know if you've ever been there, the northern peninsula of Poland is called Hell. Uh, and this is a very nice place and people go for vacation there. Uh, this is the peninsula of the, it, it looks like Cape Cod. And uh, this is the, the usual place the to go. To the hell, hell means light, right? So. Yes, but uh, it's one L, but it pronounces hell. So when we moved to the United States, uh, the first vacation, my daughter was six back then. And the first summer she's coming back and she's going to a second grade. And the first question, like the teacher asking children, so where did you go for vacation? And everybody's like, oh, I visited my grandmother in Georgia. I went to, uh, I, I, I went to Disneyland. And where did you go, Alicia? The teacher asked my daughter and my daughter says proudly, I went to hell and back. <laughs> <laughs> And this is when you get the phone call from the from the principal saying like, we have a little problem here. <laughs> uh, your daughter said something and I was like, oh my goodness, what did she say? What could she possibly say, right? And the principal says, she, she said that she went to hell and back. And I was like, well, <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> Let's use it as a you teaching wish. moment. It's an actual nice yes. place. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yes. vacation place. <laughs> yes, it's a vacation place. This is what we this is what we do. We go to hell uh, for vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mess up with her, right? <laughs> yeah. I say I hope you enjoy uh, reading Faust in a very very close future, right? Uh, there's a cat. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, this is really a timeless story. Uh, I think that this is why, you know, like there's some, some stories that die off and some stories that stay. And uh, this is a timeless story. This is a timeless question. I think what do we do? Like to, yeah, like love the the story of kind of like challenging the ultimate evil right i mean and it's actually become a too much of a trope like for my taste sometimes but um but there but there are even there's even um you know daniel webster and the devil i mean all of these challenge challenges of the devil using your wits right mm -hmm. Yes, and when you think about the folk devil that this is really possible right how the story you know and you know, Debbie down in Georgia, the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Devil's in the house in the rising sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to play, uh, I mean, electric guitar or a slide guitar, then sell your soul. <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, Professor Fogel, uh, and to your to your question about um, various societies and how they depict women, I, I all of a sudden I was thinking of in Greek mythology they did try with uh, the Amazons, but uh, Odysseus came and uh, with a you know a sword and uh, that was the end of that. More, well, more yeah, or less. The thing. yeah, the Amazons are also pictured as being living far away from other humans, right? They yeah, live in Crimea society, yeah, mm -hmm. and then they're and then they're also kind of like uh, um, used politically by the Athenians to 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 say how masculine they are because they can face the the Amazons, you know. But mm -hmm. in, in in the Iliad, they crop up just as another fighting force, you know. <laughs> I mean, and you know, in Virgil, yeah. Camilla. She's she's another warrior. I mean, it's kind of cool that she's a woman, but it's like it doesn't have anything to do with her goodness or badness. I mean, she's just kind of, yeah. you know, happens to be a warrior. Yes, because this is the idea, like what, like a witch, right? A woman, but not a woman exactly, right? Uh, because they stressed all the time how masculine they are, right, and how cruel they That's are. Yeah, because it 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 means that in order to 
be seen as good, like Joan of Arc, right? You know, like in order for someone to to actually make their way as a woman and be seen as good, she has to take on these masculine qualities because the feminine ones are no good. So, so, so to prove herself, she needs to. Yes, but even with this, look what happened to her, <laughs> right? Well, exactly. You know, like that, it, it couldn't have ended well. <laughs> yeah, yes, no, and, like, uh, a... you kind of hope, but every time you see one, you know, you like. Joan of Arc, yeah. and I'm thinking of uh, uh, the fact that we didn't have uh, uh, Salem wizard trials. We had Salem witch witches trials. So uh, yeah, I feel were... like this is even even in this period. This is still in flux, right? Because because Sophonisba does a, a great job of becoming a painter. I mean, we have some examples of women who become prominent and. Artemisia uh, is another is another uh, Brunelleschi uh, or Artemisia um, is another female painter, you know, from from the Renaissance who did fine, and like there are people out there challenging that stereotype, you know. But look at this uh, when we talked about Eastern European, and I talked about witches because this is what interests me more. But when I talked about a wizard. I don't really have a good example from Eastern European. There is no wizards That's in the stories. There is a witcher, though. There is. Can you tell us about right? that? <laughs> <laughs> People who watch my Netflix, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> there is a witcher who is also an aberration. So in the way, this Eastern European wizard is more like a witch than a Western wizard. Huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of like, even in the show, he's kind of like a, he's not a bad person necessarily. I feel like he's like in between good and evil. He's like the middle man, essentially. Don't make me start on this watch, uh, on this show. Don't <laughs> make me start. <laughs> No, it's so heavily Americanized. I know why, right? Because for this American audience, but it doesn't get the story right. And you know, the people always complain about you know they base stories being retold for different audiences, right? But in a, in a book, it's much more. Uh, it's a much more like it's a heavier story. So what? there's a book. There's a book? a book. Yeah. There's a book. Naturally, there's a book. Yes. Okay. I'm like a, a book. huge reader. I love that type mm -hmm. of stuff. So yes, there is a book. <laughs> yeah, the so you know, like in the book, like the Witcher has to give up his humanity to become what he is. Like he's not even a human any longer. Who's the um? Who's the book by? Sapkowski. Oh, I can put it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I read the first book in high school. I thought it was pretty good. I was in ninth yes, grade. Yeah, I, yes. I, I enjoyed it. Oh, you see? <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. This ambiguity here, it's, it's heavier, right? That's, this, is not a, this is really, really not a wizard. And the concept that the male can be actually a witch, right? And how he does his magic, right? It's not magic any, any longer. It's really hands on. He's immortal, isn't he? But he could be killed. But he could be, yes. there, there is a trick. There. Yes. So it's like, you know, this is the, the part of being not completely human, right? It's like balancing on this boundary yeah. that's neither human and not a monster, but not a saint. Uh, not completely like men, but not a female either, right? Uh, it's like a centaur, like kind of in that way, a little bit. Yes, yeah, it's, it's like the, the liminal creatures, right? This is, and this is what I think that the witch really is. Uh, this is a very interesting thing, and I'm really, really struggling with this because I'm writing a book, book about a photographer. And uh, I'm writing a book about the photographer as a trickster. And in Slavic languages, there is no word trickster. Hmm. There is no concept in the word for it. No concept of it. Nope. 
But so the so the Witcher or, or the witch figures don't really play that role at all. No, I'm talking about a trickster. There is no oh, word they for don't a trickster. Shame the trickster. They don't they don't no. go in that direction. No. But and you know, like there there are characters like this in stories, but very rarely, and there is no category for that. Because it's not a clown, it's not a joker. This is different, which for me is fascinating. And I, I read a book uh, actually on Russian literature, a prominent uh, book analyzing this kind of character in Russian literature, and the author uses the English word for it. Hmm. Is there any type of a clown or fool figure? And yes, yes, but this is not the same. What about like someone that's like mischievous, I guess? Yes, but there is something mischievous, like, you know, there are mischievous characters in Slavic mythology, obviously, but they never achieve the status of a trickster. Okay. They're like minor. The trickster is minor, but hmm. no word. Can you imagine? Wow. Wow, so that seems huge to me. Yeah. It's really like that, you know, like anybody of you, if you speak uh, more than one language, you know what's happening to you, right? It's not a question of vocabulary. You are a slightly different person when speaking a foreign language, different language, right? It's the, the entire system of thinking is different. And when we are talking like witch or twist, uh, trickster or wizard, it's not about, we can use the same words, but not at the same time, not talk about the completely same thing. I think that's because when you inherit a language, you also kind of inherit the worldview that comes with the language. So that's why it's like two, that's why like when I speak Arabic, for instance, I feel like a completely different person sometimes than I'm speaking English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Yes, because the system is different, right? The system is different, the, the concepts are different, but also when you speak two different languages, these different languages start belonging to the spheres of life. So you can speak Arabic about one part of your life and English about the other, and then not necessarily or the other ways. Mm -hmm. That's why artificial intelligence is doomed because it just oh, can fully. replicate. <laughs> I cannot replicate. <laughs> we'll never be able to replicate this ability of ours to, to uh, multitask in different languages. Yes, and to adjust and to fill the gaps, right? Because this is what we are doing all the time, like filling the gaps, like trying to, to understand the machine. You know, if you ever use Google Translate, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> no, that's not work. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't. It, it actually does work if you if you know a bit about the language. You can often go back and forth until you get the right translation. But you have yes. to know something first. You can't. You can't like put stuff in and it. it, it it gives you something close to it, but it but it doesn't really do a very good job with nuance. And so, so like it'll, you know, it'll totally mistranslate some things, and then and misunderstand kind of like if it's not understanding anything, but <laughs> but like it'll it'll kind of pick the wrong option for you. Yeah. But it's it's not crazy though. Uh, but but yeah, like I I love that that when you because I remember feeling like this like when you start to learn another language and get pretty good at it you start to sort of live in a different world while you're talking that language and you can't easily pull it back into the other language like you're you you are you have to use all of the all of the ways of thinking about walking down the street even you know like that are in that language push and pull, like can have opposite senses, you know, like, it, it, oh, yes. you know, like you, you receive things instead of uh, taking them or you, you know, like there's lots of different ways in which the, the language just kind of like, you have to say it differently. You can't, you can't do it another way. Yeah. I put this Pocock 
quote into the, I've loved this ever since I saw it like a really long time ago. Um, J.G.A. Pocock is this philosopher and, and he pointed out that like the language itself, you know, has that what the ancestors put into it, you know, you can't, you can't get away from it. You're, it's like, they're just going to talk through you no matter what. <laughs> yes. And when you read Faust and so uh, speaking of languages, please remember that this, this ability of speaking many languages is considered dangerous. Right, right. This is like devil's ability. Right? That, uh, beast that yeah. speaks sounds. Mm -hmm. And also tricksters do this. Cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't want to keep people uh, over, but uh, but yeah, like if if anybody has ideas or thoughts about this, and um, of course you can, you know, write something profound and, and beautiful, and then you will get fifty points um, for, for for of extra credit. But um, but you, <laughs> but also if you just want to kind of continue the conversation, I'd be really up for that in the discussions or wherever you can, this, you know, um, wherever you can get a word in edgewise in this class. I mean, it's a very strange class because we're entirely online and we don't get to, you know, meet that often. So, or at all, really. <laughs> Thank you so Bye. much for doing this. Um, Joanna, thank you. I have to say I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I cannot believe I, I'm saying this, that I would enjoy a Zoom meeting ever in my life again, but I did. <laughs> uh, it was fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. I enjoyed it as well. Definitely very insightful. I, I really enjoyed it. It got me thinking about a lot of things that you just sort of inherited. And yeah. uh, just, just unpacking all of those loaded thoughts is really always interesting to me. Yeah, I'm walking away with with uh, so many different clues that now I have to kind of you know it's like a crossword puzzle that I'm gonna start building. Yeah, working on. Yes. I think yes. is gonna be a woman to, for to me for now on. I think I like that one better than the other guy. I, I definitely <laughs> do. I like that one better. Okay. But remember, it's always work in progress, right? Yes. If the puzzle doesn't solve itself, no, nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you all soon. Mm -hmm. See you. Thanks.